period. But what we're going to talk about now is the quality of data to input into SCR and how can we maximize this? Because if we don't have quality data, I mean, Kustub talked about the way to uh, get quality data in terms of laying out our camera traps, but what about the individual photos to carry out individual ID? How can we maximize a a good quality photos? And then how can we process those photos to reduce our errors in the process? Because we're talking about thousands of photos in some cases that we need to process and go through and that leads to errors uh, and mistakes. Um, so luckily, I mean, a lot of what I'm sharing now is actually been the hard work of Puji, um, in, in the, uh, in, who is one of the participants. So I just want to, uh, she has so much experience on this. So if any of you guys have any questions, also write in the chat, chat and Puji can also um, uh, provide any support on her experience for over, over 10 years of doing this work. Um, so without ado, let's start. I'm just going to share my screen. And many of you, and feel free to write in the chat, um, and Kustub is there or Puji is there to answer any questions uh, during my pr the presentation. So, the, so what we're talking about, if you've seen the pause process, you've seen that maybe there's different kind of data that potentially we're collecting for pause to understand uh, our density and create density maps. And if we are getting data from camera trapping, there's a whole process of image sorting and tagging, and then uh, of individual identification. So let's start first before that process relating to actual collection of our images from camera trap data. So how do we val uh, maximize the value of our photos in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality? So here's an example of um, collecting uh, camera trap data for snow leopards on the Russian-Mongolian border. Um, and I mean, I don't know why Puji actually sent me on this mission somehow. She sent me on this mission and said, you join this team and you're going to spend uh, a few weeks with them. And it took, we had, it took us three days to hike into this area to set up camera traps. So you, you couldn't access it very, uh, very easily. And then we had to set up the camera traps. And obviously, you're not going to be able to check these camera traps and see how they're doing if they're taking taking good photos, or if snow leopards are actually coming in front of the camera traps. So this is important to consider when we, as the areas of snow leopard habitat, even in the lower elevation areas of their range, they're hard to access. So we need to think about how do we have, find cameras that have long battery life, that are robust, enable to stay in the field and get good quality photos throughout our sampling period that could be up to one season, right? As Kustu mentioned, we want to maximize the number of captures of photos, and that could be three to four months we leave our camera traps out. Um, so we need to think about the batteries that are put into the cameras. Puji will know more about this, but about what batteries are, often it's nice to use rechargeable batteries and just to be conscious about how otherwise we're using batteries and uh, it's creating a lot of waste. But in terms of rechargeable batteries, which batteries are good in order to uh, be able to be used across years or ensure that your camera is active throughout the whole period. So that's something maybe we want, we should think about. And also think about in terms of the camera trap model, how is it tolerant to these extreme weather conditions? So in areas again, like the Gobi and Mongolia, the, the sites where snow leopards are can vary in the summer to 40 degrees positive degrees Celsius to minus 40 in the winter. So that's an extreme range of temperature. So you want cameras that are really robust to deal with that range. In other areas of the snow leopard range, like uh, the Himalayas, Pakistan, um, uh, India, there is also very extreme temperatures, especially during the winter. Um, so it's thinking about how can you choose your model, which ensure is able to tolerate such conditions is something to, to consider. Also, Here's another photo of a snow leopard we know very well now in Mongolia called uh, the dude. Uh, I don't know why he's called the dude. Uh, maybe Kustum and Puchi can uh, tell me the insights on that. He's big. But this snow leopard, the dude. 
<laughs> he's okay. He's very big. Yes, he's one of the biggest snow leopards ever collared in the South Gobi. I think around 54 kilograms, so a really big uh, individual. And he has this tendency to walk up to your camera as you see him coming. And you see the camera suddenly kind of move and then kabong. You know, and he has done this over four times uh, with different camera traps. And I think in one case, the SD card was missing um, and it disappeared. And I've heard Orian, who also works uh, in the study, talked about how that's really hard to do if you don't have a thumb or fingers, right? So, but snow leopards manage to do this. And in many cases, it can be also cubs young moms and cubs are known to play around with the cameras and destroy them. So this is something to consider. Can you set up your camera traps to avoid such situations um, so that you don't lose valuable data? Also, I mean, it's a lesson that uh, is really valuable uh, is to know that, I mean, Puji, she's here and she can tell you, these, this camera, this old Reconyx model, is they were bought initially in 2008 and teams are still using them now in the, in the field. And I think that we still have around 10 or so of these, um, these cameras. So that's over 10 years, I mean, 12 years of uh, being used every year to collect snow leopard data. So in terms of uh, capture, uh, planning your surveys, we know that in one survey season, sometimes it is really hard to carry out our individual ID because you're just carrying one season. You don't get all the sides of your individual, the tail, the back. So you, it's sometimes very hard to compare all photos and say this guy is different from this side, this guy. And it, doing appropriate individual ID, we'll talk about later, is really important for SCR modeling. So how do we do this? Well, one recommendation is to maybe plan, if you can, if you have the resources, if it's part of the plan, monitor over multiple years. And then you get to know your individuals, you get to know their spot patterns, and then you really have a more robust estimate of how many individuals there are, and that is, provides more robust uh, data to input into your SCR model. Another thing to think about is when setting up our camera traps, how do we, uh, provide, not bias our estimates in terms of the snow leopard coming and the encounters. So in terms of, I mean, if you do have half of your cameras that potentially have flash and then half that are infrared, you can set them up so that you, you do kind of a study and see, okay, does the flash influence the encounter rate? There's a way to stratify, you know, and plan for it. But if you're not planning this and then you just put out your, a few have flash and a few have infrared, that might affect your um, encounter rates of your snow leopard individuals. You can model this later as Pustu said, you know, we do model covariates to encounter rates, but what if our data is not, uh, we don't have that much data, um, we might not want to add another unnecessary covariate to our, uh, to our analysis when we could have planned for this um, and avoided uh, such scenarios. So we recommend not actually using flash, but using infrared for nighttime photos. And we know snow leopard individuals are more active in the dusk or dawn, so it will be dark, um, so the many of the captures will be at night. Another thing about flash is I've known some people use it flash for uh, common leopards in Sri Lanka, and it only gets one or two pictures because the flash happens so fast and it takes time for the battery to reboot before the next flash can happen. So that risks leading to uh, just one photo that is hard to ID for individual identification. So here, now we're traveling back uh, to Mongolia. And another thing to think about is the sh fast shutter speed. If possible, less than one second or uh, 0 0.5 second. But in a way that, I mean, this is a nice test. This is Zaya in the Zolon Mountains in the South Gobi. And you can see her cub. You actually capture her in, in midair jumping. So, I mean, maybe you, if we can, test your cameras and see if you can see yourself jump. And that might be a test of, is your trigger speed fast enough to be able um, to capture your animal? I mean, and ideally, it's not about seeing if your snow leopards jump. It's really seeing, okay, if the animal went really fast in front of your camera trap, would your camera capture it? 
because some cameras, the trigger speeds are really slow and then they actually miss the animal or you just get the tail and then you can't do any individual ID and the data is lost. So how do you maximize this? Well, it's really important to check your models and have a fast uh, shutter speed and potentially increase the rate of pictures uh, per trigger. So here's another picture. I think this is Anu and her cub, and they're at a water hole. And you can see that, I mean, it's set at photos, taking photos, but at five photos per trigger. And it's almost like a video. Um, you see the whole behavior, you see the left side, you see the right side, you see the tail, um, and you can really kind of try to build your identification uh, map of that different, different individuals from these kind of captures. So you want to ensure many photos, no delay, and high sensitivity to ensure you capture um, those, those individuals. And then back to going um, the fact that many of our photos are at night and our snow leopards are very fluffy, right? And if, if the goal is individual ID, um, it's, it's important to have that fast trigger speed, especially at night, because that's when the photos get really, really blurry. Um, Kustub shared earlier what happens if many of your encounter rates are not usable for ID. Um, well, that happened to uh, one study we were involved with um, in China, in the Chilean Shan Mountains, and 50% of the photos were not usable. The capture rates, were, uh, capture events were not usable for individual ID. So you can imagine in that case, uh, it's pretty disheartening if a lot of the data you spent months collecting, putting in, in the field, you come back and half of your photos are not usable. It's, it's yeah, it's pretty disheartening. So it's to think about this and thinking, okay, how do, does my camera take pictures at night and testing that in order to see, okay, can I check, am I able to distinguish different individuals um, is, is really important. Another just a small kind of advice related, many of you might know this directly um, in terms of placement of cameras. If you're placing your cameras and it's directly towards the sun, often it's really hard to actually see the individual spot patterns. This is just a nice, beautiful example of our snow leopard called Beneke in Gerban Sehan. Um, but other photos, uh, you can't even tell the idea. It's total pit, pit, uh, black uh, where the snow leopard is and you can't even see who it is. Um, so it's being mindful and showing that your camera trap is not facing where the sun might be from morning to evening. And if you're setting it up, you know, in over a season, we know that the sun changes also in latitude. Um, so just being mindful of where the sun might be um, to, as you set up your camera traps. And uh, mindful of vegetation. So uh, often in, uh, this is a camera Puji has set up with the team in Sivre. And we know from uh, the coloring data that many of the females, um, they normally then near some water holes, right? Which, uh, which they might visit frequently with their young cubs or um, themselves when their cubs are in their den. And for example, in this case, this water hole is near, in the springtime and summer, a lot of grass grows around this water hole. Um, luckily, the, photo, the camera is really well set up, but the grass is not in, exactly in front of the lens. But that often happens. The grass will grow and it will grow in front of your lens. So any wind that, that comes, the, the camera will trigger and obviously your batteries will be uh, eventually used up. Maybe the SD card space will be used up and you won't be able to capture, you know, ensure uh, capturing your, your entire season for that one camera trap. So being mindful of vegetation, where you're setting it up and how your vegetation might change over that season. I found, I don't know, we found that in the Gobi, it's easy to find areas that are kind of barren and rugged um, so that you don't have as much risk of vegetation. But there are other areas, um, especially on the Tibetan Plateau, which are very vegetative in the summer. Um, so it, the capture rates actually reduce and the quality of captures reduced during the summer. So just being mindful of that. And uh, marking locations. So this is uh, Gustav here, and he's pretending to be a snow leopard. And he's, uh, he uh, has his setting up his, uh, the camera trap to uh, at a marking site. Because in terms of uh, this SLT and the Snow Leopard Conservation Foundation, 
we only really have a limited number of camera traps and we try to cover uh, multiple study sites per year, but with only around 40 to 45 camera traps, uh, Puji, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. So with only 40 to 45 camera traps, how do we uh, maximize our data as Kustub shared? Well, we put one camera trap per location. And if we put one camera trap per location, ideally it's great to set it up where the snow leopard will turn around. We'll spend some time, like at a water hole, like at a marking site, so that you're, you get multiple pictures, you're able to do ac your ID accurately. The other technique we use is we survey every year um, since uh, as our prime study areas, and then other study areas might be every other two years so that we get to know our individuals. Um, but there are cases where maybe this is not, you have many cameras, you're in this lucky situation. You have, so, you have over 150 cameras, but the cameras are maybe less good quality, then it might be good to set up two camera traps so that you can ensure both sides and the ID is more successful. But what if you have no marking sites, then potentially it's better to set up travel routes. Uh, and the travel routes are where you will maximize your encounters of those different individuals and potentially get both sides. So this is, again, I think Anu or Dajina, who has been monitored for over 10 years, one of the oldest uh, female snow leopards in, in the Gobi that we know of. And finally, um, easy to install because um, uh, this is something I have been, uh, I've experienced and, and, and I know that uh, we all probably experience this when you're in hard conditions in the field, you have a team, it's not just you, it's about the team, it's about your project. And you want everyone going home wanting to come back next season. So you want your rangers to feel like, okay, that will, uh, I, the, the main leader of that team didn't kill me and I can still walk. So if you want to do that, and that's difficult in snow leopard habitat, for example, you see here. So ideally it's good to think about, okay, the easiest place where you can install it, but that's often also where the snow leopard goes because they use travel routes, they use animal routes. So in some cases it is a place where you can maximize your captures. But also being mindful of theft, there are many areas where this is a problem and then you will lose a lot of your, your data. So, Going back to ID, I would like everyone to take a moment, let me try and do a poll. Can you look at these two cameras, these two photos, and tell us who they are? In the meantime, Kustu can tell us more about one of the, uh, one of the individuals, these individuals. So are they the same or different? Okay, some of the votes are coming in. We've chosen three areas on this on the the snow leopard because it's important to think, you know, snow leopard spots often look very similar between two individuals. So it's important to check not just one site, but multiple sites. Um, and potentially across generations, similar spotting patterns can uh, be detected uh, is a risk. I mean, this is a hypothesis uh, that we have. So it's important to think, okay, multiple um, locations when you're doing your ID. Are there any more uh, votes that are gonna come in? Okay, well, everyone is correct. These are different individuals. So now I'll let Kustu chip in on who <laughs> these two individuals are. Uh, Kustu, you're muted. Thank you, Justine. Yeah, and these two individuals, they really made our life difficult uh, when we first got them. Uh, they have incredible similarities. And as Justine saying that uh, we've tried to almost make it a a rule of thumb to look for at least three differences or three similarities, primarily owing to a lot of similar experiences, especially with related individuals. So if there is a mother cub or parent offspring pair, mother with her grown up cub or you know a father 
or you know uh, and his cup which may have grown up somewhere else you do end up with the similar patterns and here you can see some patterns are so similar that you almost want to call them the same till you start looking for three differences and then you realize ah it's not really the same it's actually different individuals so so and, and the same goes on the other way around as well you know to to call two individuals as different again you need to look for three differences and if you can't find three differences or three similarities just throw it away for that time being use it later but that's that's an important point and yep this relationship is sometimes uh, between individuals can at times make life a little more difficult mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll go into also what we uh, some recommendations for ID, but that is one of the key recommendations is these three locations. Um, so to keep going, though, I mean, this, these are were all ideal situations, right, to maximize our capture rates. But the problem is we often are limited in resources. And if, for example, if we want what uh, Kustub mentioned, 35 to 40 camera trap locations, and we are, we're gonna just put one camera per location. Depending on your model, this could cost between $6,000 to $18,000. So I mean, that's not a small sum. Um, and if you wanted two cameras uh, per site, that would double. Um, so it's, it's important to think about and important to plan, especially if you're aiming for SCR, because sometimes paying that extra amount to get the better images is worth it but it's important to understand your camera to know your camera and see what works in in your habitat and that's why we, we're not actually recommending any particular models necessarily um it's more i think it's up to you to look based on your resources uh, what can be done and what uh, what can you achieve because there are many different models out there um some more made nationally as well we know there are many chinese models available now that are actually quite robust um, so it do uh, re, and there might be other locally uh, manufactured uh, camera traps that are worth looking into and there are many different papers now available that actually compare these different um, camera traps and this is just a, a paper uh, that was recently published but what we really recommend is actually related to the quality of images because our goal is individual id and we want to maximize the correct identification of individuals we also recommend models that are durable that are robust for these harsh snow leopard locations and uh, finally, the cost in terms of cost per number of camera traps you can get uh, with your resources in order to ensure you get enough encounters, you cover enough your, your area. And finally, how do you know? Well, here we have Fuji to the left back in 2008 testing some of these camera traps um, with her team. Um, and then to the right, we have another uh, team, um, I think from, uh, from Speedy testing some of the cameras out in India. And they, I mean, they did a pilot study initially to test, okay, do these cameras actually work? How, where should we set them up? And, 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 and this is, you know, many months. So it's worth uh, figuring that out, testing in the field and in the office. But then back to site uh, location. Sometimes you have an area. Um, so we're, uh, we're gonna talk about it later, but we're gonna introduce a, an app that kind of helps you design your study area in terms of where to put your camera traps. But that app might suggest a general location. And it might be, for example, here, set up your camera here. But then you have to decide the exact location of where you're gonna put your camera trap. And um, obviously, we're lucky here, actually, because there are many locations that look ideal. This is, again, I think, in Tost in the South Gobi. And um, I think the, the saddles of these, we know snow leopards travel along ridges. We know they, they leave signs along saddles, which are these kind of lower U-shaped uh, things in the mountains. And, and then they also like to use valleys. But here, which saddle would we use? This is a question for you guys. Which saddle is ideal um, to, to set up our camera traps? I mean, some of them might also have canyons overhanging and we know that they, sign, they leave signs there. So maybe, you know, that might also be ideal. But sometimes we're, we're spoiled and there's so much choice. Well, the trick and which 
uh, I didn't know uh, Pucci was here actually. So I was, and I was going to tell, it's kind of embarrassing because she's here, but I'm telling her story. For her masters, she actually surveyed almost entire tossed area, which is over a thousand kilometers squared or a thousand five hundred kilometers squared, looking for snow leopard signs initially before setting up the camera traps. And therefore, you know, based on where signs were, then she was able to set up where her cameras is best ideal to go. So I think this highlights that it's important to also understand your area, look where are the signs, um, where are these kind of uh, highways of crossroads where many snow signs are left by different individuals and can you set up your cameras there to maximize your captures of several different individuals as well. And noting though that these highways change across years potentially or the ideal sign locations change and it's okay across years to change your location and maximize your encounters. Um, so that I mean that's something to think about if you're doing multi-year assessments still maximize the, the capture rate uh, at the different locations. So, I mean, these are just, reg, uh, just a set of recommendations that we have. Many of you might have other recommendations for your area. So please uh, share, uh, share them in, uh, in the chat because uh, we always love to hear other recommendations or other experiences you may have. Um, but I think the, the take home message is that uh, find, a way to maximize the ID of, uh, of your individuals. And in some cases that might even be setting your camera trap to, uh, at the, to take videos. And this is often uh, the case in, in some, uh, with some teams I know in China, for example, their Shang Shui and WWF, they're setting their cameras to take videos of the different individuals because the videos, they actually get more sides of the individual or they set it at videos and photos so that they get many different photos. So that might be okay, but they are able to switch the SD card often um, so that the SD card doesn't get full, for example. So, I mean, those are things to think about whether you put two or one camera trap in a location, that's also something to think about. And it's going back to that same message we talked about in the first session is about planning and really thinking you know, about your equipment, what you have and, and know your camera, know your study area, know your, your snow leopards in that area. And our PAWS uh, GSLEP guidelines, which will be available soon on the GSLEP website, provide some of these guidelines then and with more information um, about that. So I think now we're going to go and from there, I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to write in the chat. Um, and from there, we're going to talk about individual ID and how to go about that. Um, and, and ensure that we do our IDs correctly uh, and that we're not putting the wrong information into um, SCR. So I'm going to switch sharing my screen quickly. If anyone has any questions, feel free. Or Kustu, do you have anything to add? Feel free before we go into the ID. I'm good, and, and this is this is such a valuable discussion, Justine. Maybe we can ask people if they have any comments or suggestions about what they have faced as a problem. Like there was a very good question Arslan raised. Uh, so Arslan, I'll, I'll answer. So Arslan was asking that if two cameras capture the same snow leopard with different body sizes, and they are looking different, then <laughs> so. If, if they're looking different and you can find more than three differences, then they're definitely different snow leopards, I think. But if they're looking different, but they're actually the same snow leopard taken from different angle or some uh, same camera has looked from two sides or two different cameras have looked at the same location, then uh, yeah, I think you need to figure out what's making it look like the same snow leopard. I mean, and, and if you have any doubts, just discard that data. We'll talk about it later, but just discard that data if you have doubts. By the way, size is something that's almost never possible. Uh, at least we've never found it easy to determine the size of the snow leopard based on just camera trap pictures. That dude, dude that uh, Justine was talking about, on some images, he looks like this little miniature snow leopard, right? And then on some pictures, he just looks like this tiger, you know? And there used to be another snow leopard, I forgot his name, uh, 
Arjun, Arjun, I think. And he used to look massive on some pictures and really tiny on others. So by the way, on that note, just want to let you know that we are working with the Tokyo Institute of Technology to create 3D camera traps, which will have, like we have binocular vision. These camera traps will use the same unit. There'll be an extension and they'll be able to help tell the size of the cats. But that's a few uh, months down the line. It's the prototype is ready. It's 3D printed and all. We're just waiting for this whole COVID to stop. But yeah, uh, to size, I think I'll, I'll not be very uh, uh, comfortable. Uh, I think you should be take it with a pinch of salt that they look different in size unless you have better suggestions. 